send you the link because Bell want to go live. And that link, you can use it to share it with your family or friends or those who may be eagerly waiting to see your face on the Debrief TV show. All right, we are live. All right. So we are live on Facebook. Let me go back to Zoom. All right, good afternoon. Oh, I'm, I'm, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Awesome. Sorry, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Debrief uh, TV show. We are live. We're happy to be here again with you for yet another um, to yet another debrief TV show. Um, thank you, thank you each and everyone. Um, as always, we like to take a couple of minutes to just send the link out to those that are waiting to see the show. We ask that for those who are signing on, that you too can please go ahead and share the link with your um, friends and families as we delve into a very important topic today. Uh, we're just going to give we're just going to give persons a chance to log on on the show, but we're asking that you um, please share the show with person. So just give us um, a split second while we just um, share the links. But I, if you're coming on, um, I'm seeing people coming on fast and furious. Please share the link as you come on, and as always, we encourage you to please like the show like the page, share the page so that you know when we go live on uh, the Debrief TV show, which comes to you every single Tuesday uh, here on Facebook Live. So I've sent the link, you wanna go ahead and share the link. Um, I've sent the link, you can share the link with Saffron and the rest. Um, for anyone that is on here, you can feel free to go uh, on Facebook to go to Debrief TV show, like the page, share the page as well. And, and just, in a minute, we will start as I can get the link shared out. Okay, so just bear with us. We will come to you pretty shortly. Our friends are here with us. Sorry. Oops. Yeah, so as always, I just saying, if you can, please help us share the link. Uh, we're going to have a very robust conversation. Um, it's a conversation that people are waiting on. The topics are going to be very interesting. So, uh, so we just need you the time to sign in and to be able to join us for the conversation. But I'm asking that you also share the link to help us to get more people um, on board in the conversation. And follow the debrief TV show so that you are always up to date and um, to know knowing when we come live to you. So I've posted everywhere. All right. So thank you for those who are signing in. Good night. Uh, good night, Esther. Good night to all you guys that are jumping on board. Um, before we start the discussion, um, I would love to invite uh, Mr. Sean Clark, who is the CEO of Supreme Counseling okay. for Personal Development. And you would have seen okay. um, in the media lately that Supreme Counseling for Personal Development would have launched an app. And that app would focus uh, focus on reporting bullying, deviant behavior, and a number of other things. Um, as we would have obviously be seeing um, some of our children and, and, and misbehave in certain ways and, and, and abuse and um, bully people. And we, you know, we welcome an app like this where people could be will report anonymously. Um, and I won't take too much of Sean. Sean, let him, I will let him go ahead and explain what the app is about. And also for those who are listening and those are on, on, on um, Facebook Live that um, to see how you can play a part with this app. Sean, all right, welcome. Go ahead. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Sean, Kimar. Uh, good evening to each and every one of you. Good evening, Barbados. Uh, I want to thank Kimar for giving me um, a little time to very quickly uh, explain the Safe Zone Reporting app. Now, I want to start by uh, dismissing a myth that has been put out there because of an unfortunate um, headline by one of our media houses um, where it indicated that the app is one to report bad behavior. 
And because of that, uh, I think we've started getting some negative stick because of um, what I will call a misleading headline. The CSO reporting app is an anonymous app, yes, and it was launched yesterday and we are piloting the app in seven, sorry, in eight secondary schools across the island. We know that over the years when our young people, there are young people who would have been bullied and because of the fear of retaliation, because of the fear of intimidation, they keep quiet and they suffer in silence. We also know that over the years, uh, we as adults and children as well, we see fights, we see other aggressive behaviors happening across Barbados. We will take our cell phones out, we will, we will record a video or whatever, and we will place it on, on social media where it can do little to no good. We are seeing now that here is an avenue with an anonymous reporting app that you can, you can still take that video, but then you can upload that video to the respective school and then it can be actioned. So what we are basically doing is, off, is getting Barbados involved, giving Barbados the opportunity to become the school's watchdog, help the school to, with its supervisory systems to bring our children in line. Now, the app is, is not an app only for negative behaviors. Uh, I will read very quickly some of the common behaviors that can be reported. We are looking at assault. We are looking at abuse, whether the abuse is verbally or whether the abuse is physical. We are looking at bullying or regular intimidation, bragging about an upcoming plan uh, um, attack. So you might hear a group of children uh, on the school premises planning to have an attack somewhere in uh, Bridgetown or Spikestone or Oystons after school. These are, this is something that can be reported so that now the school, the management of the school can be proactive and stem that behavior before it actually starts. Additionally, the app can also be used uh, to report depression. Any of our children that are, that are suffering with anxiety, uh, gun violence or any other type of violence, harassment, reckless behavior, social isolation or withdrawal, substance abuse. We know a lot of this happened on the school, on, on the school site and off the school site. Suicidal ideations, if you have a friend and, and your friend is, is, is talking of suicide, having suicidal tendencies, these are all things that you can use the app to report. Now, it was also said staff, staff free, that it sounds as if the app is only to report negative things. And I also want to dismiss that as well, because yeah. the reality is that at the end of the day, you have this app, you download this app as a Barbadian, you have this app on your phone, and you, you pass a particular bus stop every morning, and there is this one child who is always well-groomed, who is quiet, who is away from the crowd, you know, who, who is exhibiting the type of behaviors that we as adults and our parents will want our children to exhibit. That can also be reported. And then there can be some positive reinforcement system put in place to award that young man or that young lady for that, that type of behavior. So I'm thinking that the app, and I want to say to Barbadians, that the app is an app, it's a progressive app. You can go to, to any of the platforms, whether it be the Google Store or, or the, the uh, Play Store, you can download the app, it is free of cost. And, and you can start making your reports. We have, we launched the app yesterday and we've received two reports so far from one secondary school. And those reports are already being actioned. I, I will say as well, Kimar, if I turn back over to you, just in case you or any of your guests or panelists have any questions. There's also a question about the eight schools participating in the pilot project. In that? In the pilot project. Okay. Okay. These schools are Frederick Smith Secondary, Granley Adams Memorial, the Les Devon School, Graydon Seeley Secondary, Daryl Jordan, Princess Margaret, and Corrigan and people are saying, why 
day schools, days at the schools were always highlighted and everything that is bad, you know, attached to these schools. These schools were not highlighted. Whenever I sit with Supreme Counseling to put together any initiative for schools, that is exactly what it is, an initiative for a school. We don't look at older schools or younger schools or more progressive schools in terms of the, the, the uh, educational level. That is, that is not taken into consideration. Frederick Smith, for example, was selected. I am a very proud product of St. James Secondary School. St. James Secondary School is now the Frederick Smith Secondary School. I'm a proud student, a uh, uh, pastor of that school. And when I started Supreme Counseling in 2009, I made a solemn promise to the management of the school that everything that I do, that St. James Secondary School will benefit from, because that is the school that gave me my foundation. So that's the involvement. There are a number of these schools on here, but Grantley Adams, less the one and so on, that we at Supreme Council, we already have a relationship with for almost eight to 10 years. We've been working with these schools. We've been offering intervention to these schools. So I think it is only fair that these schools are the schools to be, to be given the opportunity for us to continue our work with the schools. Finally, Sapri, the app is not one for punitive measures. It is not a situation where we want to catch our children in the act of doing something negative and then have them suspended, have them expelled, have them go before the board of management. If the app was one of punitive measures, then I would have given the Royal Barbados Police Force permission to receive the reports as they come to hand. The app is one where we are hoping to offer a level of psychological intervention for the children that, that will need it, where we can put children in groups to help them raise their self-esteem, teach them conflict resolution, teach them about anger management. That is the purpose of the app. And that is why the Safe Zone Reporting app was introduced to Barbados yesterday. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, any questions quickly from the panel? Oh. I just want to commend him for coming up with that app, something that we need and where we need to commend folks, we ought to, where we need to highlight positives, we ought to. So I commend you, Mr. Clark. Thank you so very much, brother. Okay, thank you, Sean. Thank you for that um, um, enlightening um, and correcting the media as it relates to your app. Uh, we will continue to promote it here on the Debrief TV show. Uh, thank you, thank you for having me, and I will sit and enjoy um, your show from afar. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good evening to you. All right, good evening. All right, Kimar Stewart, um, over to you. Oh, first, first of all, let me just welcome our panel. Uh, that was just, well, thank Sean Clark for coming on from uh, Supreme Council for Personal Development. I want to introduce you to our panel. Um, my name is Kimar Safri, I'm your host. Uh, we also have Simon Ali in the host as well. And we have Kimar Stewart, another host of the Debrief TV show. We also have with us uh, a number of lawyers today, um, mm -hmm. and, and none that is not known to us. Yeah, all prominent lawyers, well known in their field, in their area. Um, and, uh, we would like to first introduce the lady among us, um, Saffron Griffith. Uh, thank you for coming on on Debrief TV show. Uh, you know, uh, she's also a yardy, <laughs> so I get I get to say that you can't say that, right? You can't say that. Yeah, um, <laughs> but we found out we're from both from Jamaica. Um, <laughs> she has the accent, though I don't have it, so just for the record. Work on that, bro. I won't hold him. I won't hold it against him. He <laughs> came here when he was a boy. But um, sure. thank you for having me. I'm Saffron Griffith. I'm an attorney at law. I'm not as prominent as the two thorn, the, the, the roses and the thorn among them. Um, <laughs> in fact, Mr. Galt was my teacher at Cave Hill and I told him right. that if I, if I chose to practice in Barbados, I'll work with him. So that's what I have been doing. I'm an upcoming attorney, I'd like to call myself. Mm -hmm. I've known Mr. Nichols for years, so they're the more prominent ones. I'm still learning at their feet. You're in good company. Uh, we would also <laughs> like to welcome Mr. Gregory Nichols. Um, yep. Among us as well, no stranger to us, no stranger to Barbados, um, as in his legal profession. Um, and I would also <laughs> like to in, uh, welcome Hal Gollop, Mr. Hal Gollop, QC, another 
well-known prominent lawyer in Barbados, and we are going to be discussing uh, the Kendrick Carmichael case. We are also going to delve in a little bit on the employment, employees' right and the justice system. And so, Kimar, over to you. Let us start the discussion. People are eager and eagerly waiting for uh, the conversation. Again, share the link, like, follow us so that you know when we go like, um, go ahead, Kimar. Cody. Yes, good night, uh, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to welcome the guests and to say good evening to the viewers. Um, our regulars, like we enjoyed. Um, Esther, thank you for tuning on yet again. Um, so let's jump right into it. Um, I, I, as I said, we we're discussing, as Safri said, we we're discussing the Carrick Carmichael case, who was a civil servant. And I just want to read from an article taken from Barbados today. It said, in the landmark case, civil servants are shielded from automatic firing for legal infractions. That is the headline. And it declared, the Supreme Court has declared unlawful the automatic dismissal of public workers on the basis of criminal convictions as it ruled on Monday in two separate decisions with wide ranging implications for employment relations in government. On Monday, Madam Justice Sonia Griffith delivered a landmark judgment in cases brought by Wilbert Lynch versus the Chief Personnel Officer, the Public Service Commission and the Attorney General and Kenrick Carmichael versus the Attorney General which now place tremendous scrutiny on the way disciplinary proceedings are conducted. The state has also been ordered to compensate the complainants for the many years they were banished from the public service because of their arbitrary dismissals, thereby setting a groundbreaking precedent for those charged with overseeing operations in the public service. Now, with that being the basis of our conversation, I will first start by the Addressing the attorneys who represent Mr. Wilbert Lynch, um, that would have been you, Mr. Nichols, I presume. Um, can you paint for us the context or the context of the case surrounding Mr. Lynch and what would have led to his um, dismissal, essentially bringing the case against the what we call the chief personnel officer? Thank you, Kimar, um, and to your team. This is really a fantastic job you're doing here. Uh, so let me big you all up for that. Uh, what can I say? I, I met Wilbert Lynch back in about 2012. And um, very simple man from Straker Stanchery, Black Rock. He brought to me a letter indicating that he had been dismissed from the public service for a matter which he had in the courts two or so years before. And what was interesting about it was that in the dismissal letter, there's always this, this warning or this invitation that you can appeal your decision to the Privy Council, which is the local Privy Council. And he wrote a handwritten letter to the Privy Council said no reasons why they should not follow this public service commission's advice that he should be dismissed. And his own handwriting, um, he said, oh, in a very clever um, argument, you know, he was a sole breadwinner in his house. He um, depended on his salary and the, and, the, and the job to look after himself and his family. He, he, the conviction was not recorded by the magistrate. The magistrate indicated that she was going to give him an opportunity to, to, to walk away with a, with a clean slate. So he went to the police record section, got a copy of his certificate of character, submitted that um, to the, the governor general. And he got another letter saying that as a result of his appeal, they are going to suspend him from the public service without pay. And then shortly after that, he was dismissed. All this happened with, with him only getting a letter and he responded to that letter. Wrote the, wrote the letter said, no, no, if the magistrate gives me a chance and an opportunity not to record a conviction against me, why are you now going to throw the hammer, throw the, throw, throw the proverbial book at me? You know? So, I mean, the case wasn't one which required me to go in to do a lot of investigation into the fact because we had all of that work done by him in that one letter he wrote asking for a chance. And 
I, I, I must say this. I mean, very early on in my practice, I had the opportunity to do a case like this. But I I wasn't so convinced about it. But I, I always, and I regretted not doing it. So I always said that whenever I get an opportunity to do this case, case on, on this right point, how is it that the, 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 the Privy Council, which is there to advise the Governor General whether to dismiss public offices or not, how is it meeting and the persons who they are considering the case, they don't have an opportunity to say anything to that, that committee, who's basically advising the government general whether they should be fired. People will lose their pension. You work in the government service for a long time and then you end up on the streets destitute. And you can't make any representation for on, on, on your own behalf or no one can do it for you. And I've always had a fundamental problem with that. It, it hurt me the wrong way. And when, when, when Wilbert came to me, I took this as an opportunity to run with the war funds. And as I said last week, it's really sad because I, I was actually shocked. Um, he, he, I mean, he, he was a bit of a character. I, I, I remember one, one day, I, I know my wife will forgive me for saying this, there was a tropical storm going on in sometime in 2011. Some storm just was around Barbados, hovering around. And he called me about two o'clock in the morning to complain that the police at the Black Rock station told him not to call back there. And he told them that he was looking out for the people in the community. And, you know, and he was so incensed. It was probably drinking a little bit too, but he was very upset and treated with the police. And my wife told me, if I don't get him off the phone at two o'clock in the morning, she will have the baby at the same time because she was just dying of laughter. So he was kind of, kind of a character, you know what I mean? And he dressed in his <laughs> finest every time he came to court. You know, almost like he was one of win an award and stuff like that from and 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 he, he by play obviously he had to come into the court. He knew all the security guards who were past colleagues. Some of them he liked, some of them he didn't like, some of them like him, some like some loved him. And he was that kind of um, character, um, very funny. Uh, I think sometimes very annoying too, to be honest. But it was very very. Um, after being around and working with somebody on a matter for so, so long, you know, um, we gave, he, he gave his evidence in the November last year. And then I, I heard he died. His sister called me. I was, I was very shocked. And knowing, knowing that we had a very good chance of, of winning this case, and I knew what it would have meant um, for him to turn his life for wrong and be vindicated. So that is basically what it, what it was. I mean, I didn't get a lot of law, but we have um, um, my learning senior um, to, to, to discuss that here as well. But it was it was one of those cases where, which I, I felt very, very happy at the result, but still very sad that this this, this simple man who who um, had had the misjudgment of taking out a ball of rum for eleven dollars and the courts gave him an opportunity. But the public service commission and the and the people who work in the public service decided that they would bring down the hammer on him. A very simple person, and 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 I'm glad that his name will forever be etched in, in, with this or put together with this other case that Mr. Gollop did to show that ordinary people to get audience will take a long time, but justice will serve. Uh, you, Mr. Nichols, you, before we go on to the other attorneys, you would have said something that was very striking to me. Um, you said that he had the, the, the magistrate ordered no conviction to be recorded against his name. Uh, if I recall reading the media recently, and you can you can paint the difference to me, um, it was said that the magistrates have no jurisdiction. Um, in regards to recording um, or not convictions against an accuser's or, or convicted person's name, basically. Um, is it a difference in terms that you were or the lower court or the magistrate's court? Um, help me here, because I mean, we're not legal minds here, so we want to understand right. what's going on and if that ruling could potentially uh, affect future cases. Um. First of all, Kimura, call me Gregory, right? 
Um, that, that was all right for me. Um, I, I took a, a, a careful note of what the judge said. And if I recall what the judge's reasoning was that when she looked at the I mean, she looked at the penal um, penal system reform act. There was no power of the court to uh, um, discharge the conviction. So once the court found you a person a person guilty of a criminal offense, the next stage was what sentence to be imposed. The court can discharge the sentence. But yes. they can't discharge the conviction. So when someone is convicted, reprimanded, and discharged, it means that there's no sentence or no penalty imposed by the court. But it does not mean that there is no conviction. And I think Mr. Gollop um, indicated that that would have ramifications because it would mean that the practice of not recording the conviction may, 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 may will have to change. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and in so doing, it would mean that persons who ordinarily get that reprieve by not having the conviction recorded yes, may not be able to get over that threshold of, of having a blank on their certificate of character. So, so that the, the certificate of character will now say that the person was convicted, but there was no penalty imposed by the court. I suppose now they will have to explain to the prospective employer, the U.S. Embassy or whatever they're relying on that certificate for, but it is a major change and I think it is something perhaps government would might, might want to determine how, how best it would try to deal with the fallout that would happen there. But it was, it was, a, it was a shock to me because my, my initial position was that if there was no conviction recorded in the, in, because it was not only the, um, the, 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 um, the everybody who was, who was charged before the court and is convicted is a conviction card. So his conviction card was what had, had, had something on it, but those things that were on his conviction card related to things that happened after he was fired from the public service. Because as I said, his, his life really went kind of downhill after he got fired, right? And he had some issues similar to Mr. Carmichael, domestic issues at home and stuff. And those things are on his conviction card. But, you know, he, his, his, the, the order book, there's an order book in the magistrate's court where the magistrate sets out, or the, 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 the clerk was set out, what is the, the, the finding of the court? what took place in what transpired in the matter. None of that recorded the conviction. Also, then there was the um, police certificate of character. So my position was that if there is nothing showing that this man has been convicted, on what basis could the Public Service Commission advise the Governor General that he had been convicted? And, you know, when, when you analyze the facts of the cases, you will see that the, the, the Crown struggled to show what they put before the, the Service Commission, what they put before the Governor General, and what before they put the Privy Council. They, they put, I put no evidence at all before the court to show, we wrote this letter, and these were our findings, these were our recommendations, and these are the reasons why you should be there. Nothing of the sort. In fact, they treated it as if he was a humbug. How dare he write a letter saying that he won a chance for the governor general. We have already decided it and the governor general is going to take our advice. So we're not really considering you. And, and, and those days, I, as I said before, have to be very military honors, full military honors. That was a system of the past, but the way in which we treat each other in an unfair manner has to come to an end. And I'm really glad that this case deals with these kind of issues. Well, uh, thank you very much for sharing that perspective. Uh, Mr. Gola or um, Saffron, you want to add, contribute or add anything to Mr. Nichols' point, and then you can take the floor as it relates to your case with Mr. Carmichael. I would, I would let Saffron uh, introduce the Carmichael case. 
she had a more intimate knowledge of it than I did. Of, of the factual matrix. Um, it, the, the Carmichael case was very similar to Mr. Lynch's case in that he was convicted of a criminal offense related to a, a domestic violence issue. And when the magistrate heard, his, heard the case, he was convicted, but the magistrate also ordered that no conviction was to be recorded. Now, this gentleman took it to mean that the Public Service Commission could not farm on the basis of him having a criminal conviction because the magistrate ordered that no conviction was to be recorded. Similarly, when, he, when disciplinary proceedings were instituted against him, he was afforded the opportunity to appeal to the local Privy Council, and they decided in his absence to compulsory retire him from the, 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 the civil service. So the, the facts are very similar to Mr. Lynch's case. And he, our issue was always, or has always been what appeared, what appeared to be the wanton and capricious manner in which he was dismissed from his employment. Because a man having worked for many years in the public service in a job that he loved, he ought not to have lost his job and emoluments and benefits without having the opportunity to state his case, to say, give me a chance. Let me tell you my side of the story. Mm -hmm. That in itself to smacks in the face of good administration. And it wouldn't, his, his issues or his case does not only the outcome or we uh, go, taking the matter to court would not just augur well for him. He won it, yes, but for generally good administration, it would apply to anybody else in the public sector that you can't just fire me wantonly or what appears to be wantonly or arbitrarily. There's a process and we must follow that process. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Gollop, you uh, yes. wanted to ask? Yes, I could, I could um, make an intervention here. Both Saffron and Gregory have focused on what is now an essential aspect of the development of public law in the Caribbean especially. We have our own peculiar system because we have a written constitution and we also have a statute that deals with matters of public law called the Administrative Justice Act. And both Saffron and Gregory spoke of that magic term called good administration. Now there's something very peculiar about the Administrative Justice Act. It speaks about good administration, but it does not tell you what good administration is. Mm. There's no statutory definition of the term good administration. But as council, and certainly as learned members of the bar and the bench. There are certain guidelines which one may use to come to a conclusion or an assessment of what may be regarded as good administration and what may be regarded as bad administration. And the evolutionary process has been pointing to a concept of what is regarded now as procedural fairness. Fair dealing in the administrative process. And the emphasis has been shifting towards may be regarded as straight line rules and regulations, moving away from that to 
a more expansive kind of approach, which takes aspects of fairness into consideration. Now, what is fairness? You do not have to put down in any definition of any statute or anything what is fair. It is that kind of thing which you appreciate when you have something unfair <laughs> done to you. <laughs> so it is one of these situations where you can, you can describe it by looking at what it is not. So certainly the learning trial judge in this case found that there was procedural unfairness. There was not procedural fairness. And these two gentlemen, even though, and this is very important, and Gregory hinted on it, Saffron hinted on it as well. Although these two gentlemen were guilty of infractions, both under the sanctions of the criminal law, that could have made them answer charges for gross misconduct. The fact that they had these charges that could have amounted to gross misconduct was not the end of the matter. You had to hear them. And what was significant in this matter, both of these matters, was that dismissal in the case of Mr. Lynch or forced retirement in the case of Carmichael were not the only remedies available to the service commission. Mm. There were six remedies available. There were six alternatives, ranging from summary dismissal, et cetera, et cetera, to one that was less stringent, a warning or reduction in salary, things of that nature. So you cannot summarily dismiss a man when he has an opportunity given to him by the same statute to avail himself of a less stringent remedy. And that was at the heart of the learned judge's um, decision. You have to give him an opportunity to say to the court, or in that case, to the Privy Council, look, there are several remedies which you may, there are several, sorry, not remedies, there are several disciplinary measures which you may take against me, but you must hear me. For adventure, I be given a chance to get a less severe penalty than one which comes at the top of the disciplinary um, ladder. So that is something which was very, very striking about, about that decision. Gregory mentioned the point about the recording of a conviction. Now, <laughs> I have practiced in criminal law for 27 years, less regularly now. And I came into the practice of law and from that habit, if I may call it that, being practiced by magistrates, when they found that there were mitigating factors and in an effort to give a man a chance, magistrates are problem solvers. Magistrates are sociologists. They, they, their job is to help protect society, yes, but at the same time, part of their job is they, 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 um, is they require to help persons to improve themselves and to give them a chance if there is any redeeming feature found in favor of those persons. So a magistrate may find out, yes, he did something that according to the statute is to be convicted. The facts of the case found that he's guilty you can't change that. That is their finding by the court. So, but look, this fellow deserves a chance. He's a young man, whatever. In the case of Carmichael, this was a 
domestic dispute and there must have been medi uh, mediating circumstances, it won't be fair to put a conviction on it. So even though he was found guilty, the magistrate took the decision to say no conviction recorded. And that has been practiced in Barbados from time immemorial. But the learned judge, as Gregory pointed out, if invoked two statutes, neither of which seem, or on the face of it, neither of which gives the, the court a discretion not to record a conviction when once somebody has been guilty. And that is something which shocked me, but I could not be but convinced when the magistrate quoted from the two statutes, and it has shocked a number of persons who have been practicing law much longer than I have been. So that is something which we will have to look at in the future. Um, magistrates are creatures of statute so that their jurisdiction is controlled by an act, the Magistrates Courts Act. So there may have to be an amendment if, for example, Parliament thinks that that discretion should be given to a magistrate. Because unless there were an appeal and that was overturned, that finding, that ruling of the trial judge, then that is the law that magistrates can no longer fail to record a conviction when once a person has been found guilty um, in accordance with the trial, uh, coming out of the trial which they had just gone through. So at that point, at this point, I would just like to say that there is a new thrust in public law, which has moved away, moved away from just simply a reliance on doing what a statute says you must do. We refer to it in our legal language as ultra virus. You act ultra virus, it means you have exceeded the limits of your statutory power. If you have done that, you may be said to be ultra virus. You have got to be intra virus. You have got to act within the four corners of the statute. And in administrative law, the ultra virus doctrine has operated to keep public functionaries within due bounds. If you move outside those bounds, well then you can be hammered with certain remedies. But in this, the, 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 the jurisprudence has taken us away from that strict application of ultra virus to what they have described as a swiftly moving emphasis towards procedural fairness. You have got to be fair. And any reasonable man, the man on the Clapham Omnibus in England, or the Bayfield ZR, or the Warrings minibus, all of those are ordinary reasonable people who could know, who would be able to say, if faced with a particular situation, that is fair or that is unfair. And fairness is the order of the day, procedural fairness. You have got to follow the procedure set out and you must do so fairly. I should like to stop at this point. Right, if I, if I may oh, add though. Uh, if fellas, add, uh, anything you want? Oh, no, sorry. let's have one finish and then we will. If, if I may add, as Madam Justice Shona Griffith stated, and I must echo Gregory's earlier sentiments in a most erudite judgment, the court is not concerned with the correctness of the decision on the part of any public authority, but the process by which that decision was arrived at. Okay. So we, the process is always the underpinning factor. Um, I have two questions here on the, the Facebook. Um, and then um, I think this one, the second one, but you can take the first one, but I think the second one, we kind of switch things up a bit. Um, John Herbert is saying, is the government going to appeal these decisions? 
So if anybody could take that question first, is the government going to appeal the decisions? Not that I'm aware of. I don't know if Mr. Nichols, if Gregory is aware of that. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't had any conversation with anyone, but I, I read an article attributed to the Attorney General, Learning Attorney General, saying that the uh, lawyers for government did not advise him that there were any grounds of appeal, but that they were awaiting the written decision, as we all are, Yes. So that, that is probably subject to change. So we, ne we one never knows, you know. Okay. Yeah. The other question um, coming from Wayne Hoy is, attorneys as brilliant as some think they are, hardly challenge or speak out about the system as it is. Hence, there have been no major changes to the to the to the many issues. That is what that's, a, that's a very that's a very vague comment. Vague comment. The mere fact that you have three council here. Who have just um, challenged mm -hmm. challenge a fundamental procedure that has been used throughout the jurisprudence of, of this country and challenge it successfully. That question doesn't seem to. <laughs> it certainly that, doesn't. That, 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 that's not so. In fact, I, 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 I happen to know that a very, very significant decision will come up next week on the bail amendments that were imposed, I think in 2019, in, in, in response to some of the upsurging gun violence and so forth, mm -hmm. where the, the right to bail has been further restricted. If you were charged with a firearm offense, you're not entitled to bail for the first two years after having been charged. And that, that I think a decision on that amendment is going to come out sometime next week. But lawyers challenge. I mean, the, the the reason why this this matter was was before the court is is, is obviously sorry uh, um, in, in in the press because both of Mr. Gulliver and myself we had a discussion. It was too far reaching a decision that the public should not know about it, mm -hmm. and, and that is why we took the opportunity to to indicate what the court had found. And as far as I'm aware, I mean, I, I am sure Mr. Gollum has had it, but lawyers from all over the Commonwealth Caribbean have been calling, asking for copies of the decision and um, in, in all sorts of different chats and stuff where you are involved in around the region. This 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 case is being talked about so that we, we right. do this work all the time. I, I, I have a question. I mean, this is working on myself all of the time, challenge the system, challenge the way in which we think. The law evolves as people and societies evolve. So um, right. a little bit off the mark there with our comment. And lawyers are perennial students. Pardon? Lawyers are perennial students. We learn every day. In fact, there's a saying, we don't know the law, we know where to find it. We have to engage, we have to interrupt, we have to disrupt, we have to bring on popular cases before the courts. So I, I, I disagree with the, the Facebook comment. Tim, I want to say something. Go ahead, Simon. Right. Um, first of all, I just want to thank um, our special guest this evening. Um, the first thing is a comment. I am thinking that when there are a lot of popular cases or certain issues that are raised and that capture the public eye, I am thinking that there may be uh, a platform for the Bar Association to even using their own social media platform or doing a public discussion, right? Because of COVID now, you really can't do like public lectures as such. But I'm thinking that the Bar Association and so on can engage the public a bit more by letting them know the developments, letting them know what are some of the hot button things that would happen in law that would concern them. Uh, as Gregory and Saffron spoke about the ordinary person um, the ordinary man or woman might want to know um, how various laws might affect their employment or, or so on. Uh, my question, though, is regarding the, the, the Public Service Commission and why it appears to a lot of um, civil servants and others that the process is so slow. And I think, um, Gregory, you lamented about that in the, um, the Barbados Today article. Is there anything that can be done to help to grease the wheels or to move along the process when it is an issue, uh, 
um, regarding public officers. He's muted. Well, it's the same, it's the same <laughs> administrative. Is Gregory responding? Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Gala. Sorry, I was yeah. on mute. Sorry. Thanks, Sorry. Mr. Gala. Sorry. Yeah. Um, it's all, it all has to do with the administrative process. Mm -hmm. um, in Barbados, we have the Office of Ombudsman. Mm -hmm. And the Ombudsman is almost essentially given a jurisdiction which seems to, or which tries to correct bad administration. All right. And bad administration usually encompasses heavily issues of delay. That's one of the key factors um, in the portfolio of the ombudsman. But sometimes people do not even remember we have a, a, a person called an ombudsman. <laughs> that is a fact. And, um, and that is not peculiar to Barbados. That is not peculiar to Barbados. In Britain, there are several, several um, ombudsmen. They're called the commissioner of so-and-so for so-and-so. So they have several of them in their process of um, administration. But the problem which you, are, which you have focused on has to do with faulty administration mm. and what one may consider as essentials to good administration. That is what this administ part of what this Administrative Justice Act is about. If you look at the long title, the short title, sorry, it describes, it is described as an act to improve administrative justice. And um, that being the focus of the statute, maybe we need a few more people practicing public law. <laughs> So mm -hmm. that um, mm -hmm. you will get more, more applications being brought before the court. All right. Challenge this bad administration and challenge what may be perceived as faulty administrative justice. And, um, but administrative law is still a very young subject. It only dates its origin as far back as the Second World War. It is one of the newer legal disciplines. Um, it came into being really in an effort. The efforts re were required to rebuild London after the bombing. So mm. it is still a very, very young subject. And we have been in Barbados in the forefront when we implemented this Administrative Justice Act in 1982. It is the, at the time it was the only one of its kind in this whole area of the Commonwealth. Trinidad now has a, a, a one as well. St. Lucia has a kind of it. Um, but we have been, we've been doing our bit, we've been doing our bit to improve administrative justice. And that Administrative Justice Act is a major piece of legislation that can go towards that improvement, which I'm speaking about. Thank you, Mr. Gollard. Sure. You wanted to report, respond, Gregory? I wanted. Um, which, which was the question again? Kimar, sorry? What was the question again? No, right. Um, what I was asking with regards, and I think Mr. Gar answered it with regards to the delays um, in the Public Service Commission, oh, coming to the service commission. And, stuff. and yeah, also I yeah. mentioned about the, this is an opportunity for the Bar Association to, you know, talk about some hot button topics that affect um, Barbadians that would generate interest and so on. Yeah, um, the, but the, the bar has been very actively yeah. involved over the last couple of years in doing things out there in the public. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, the bar communicates to the public. Well, only, only last week, we took issue with a report, a statement made by the Learning Chief Justice on... on, 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 on the on backlog. Um, right, that's right. The Public Service Commission, however, um, you know, what what I do a lot of cases that that brings into focus the way how they treat other public officers and so forth. Mm -hmm. You know, we go and look at the thing holistically. And and, and I saw in the, in the in the chat somebody asked the question: Why does the 
system of justice moves so slowly. Mm -hmm. not, only only two that. years ago, we increased the number of judges to be able to serve as a court. As I'm sure Mr. Gallup Saffron will tell you, the system is moving a lot more freer now. But Hello. it is not, you could not have a mature society and jurisdiction like Barbados. With the type of economy he had with only um, two criminal judges. Yes, yes. Right? To do all the criminal cases that they had. And then six judges, some doing family. And civil matter. Your, your system had become frozen in time. And this is not a political point altogether, because you have to have the resources to put behind the administration of judges, justice. You gotta, you gotta pay the judges, you gotta pay the support staff. And, and, and so, so we, we had to come to that point where we had to increase the bench. And what some lawyers will tell you, and, and I perhaps that, that the bench is not large enough, you know, as, as, as yet, but it has to be paid for. So that, you know, you know we, we have this concept of overdevelopment. When I say overdevelopment, in order to survive in this 21st century world, and perhaps even in the 20th, 20th century, the, the, the systems that small independent countries had to develop really outstrip their economic resources to pay for the systems True. to maintain the societies of independent countries. So that True. at the same time, you're conscious of the fact that while the, the, because if you look at the cases, the British government, the American government, these, these mature democracies do not get these things right either. So that I is why this branch of administrative law. So that sometimes we need to step back from the criticism of saying that this, this, the government is this, the government is that, or when I say the government, you know, you know what I mean, or, or the systems are poor, but it, even in societies where the systems are mature, where there's plentiful resources that are there, you know, you still have these cases where there's arbitrary action on the part of public authorities doing these things. And you will always have these things so that you, you take a more systemic um, uh, um, look at, at, at the, the, the whole structure. And you realize that, look, the, 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 the post-independent state is, is very sophisticated in its structure and its apparatus. Do we have the capacity to maintain it? And not only to maintain the systems that have to work, but also to keep refining those systems and, and, and taking them to the, the cutting edge of the new things that would drive the society and propel it forward. So that, you know, as a lawyer, we say that we don't have enough judges, but at the same time, someone will say we don't have enough teachers. We don't have enough garbage trucks. We don't have enough people dealing with issues of, of, of um, ground service water. How many people have we trained in those areas? You know what I mean? So that we will always have the challenges that a mature and, and a, a, a modern and a progressive society would have, but we, at the same time, we still have a limited resource pool. So that is a, a challenge that we have to trade off against. Go ahead, let, let me give Jackie her jacket because we can, we can cry about the deficiencies in the system, but with, with Mr. Carmichael's case in particular, uh, we were before the courts. We initiated that judicial review suit in 2017, and a new judge came on the scene last year, and I went before, we went before her in July, and she said, but we have a man who was fired. We were before the court, and his matter is languishing the court. We can't have this, not this kind of matter. That was July. The same, on that same day, she gave orders to fulfill so that we could go to trial September, which was what? August, September, two months, two months. late. Yeah. So you have people who are passionate. You have people who are willing to do the work. You have people who are willing to push the system as far as it can take them. So I just wanted to commend her okay. because we can we can cry and we can bemoan what we don't have, but we still have persons and we still have organs and we still have. Mm -hmm. All if right, I, 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 I Simon, if I could add to this comment, just ahead. before you all leave on, I just I know Kim are trying to get in. Um, but on that flip side of the deficiency within the system, one one of the comments here is saying that. 
well people uh we could read it as it is lawyers benefit financially from the inadequacy of the judicial administration so the person is trying to say that well the, the system has inefficiencies at the same time um lawyers benefit from it um whether it be you know whether they hear it or whatever what an, abs what an absurd comment so, I, 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 I know you well, right? I'm just reading right? comments, sorry. So just bear with yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. And, and how, how can you make a living off a system that's inefficient? <laughs> what an <laughs> absurd <laughs> comment. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to live if I can't the get only, The only people or... who make a living off of an inefficient system are people who are corrupt. Thank you. And I would not accept that as a, as, as a, as a badge. Of, of the profession, the distinguished profession of which you serve. That's an absurdity. Right? All right. But if, if, you look at it, if you look at it logically, a man came to us, lost his job for five years, but he has no money to pay us. So bottom line, that's as simple as I can make it. You've lost your income. You're, 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 you're sick with worry. You're despondent. How does that benefit a lawyer? How does he pay you? Who will pay to get his, his matter started? The ink, the paper, the stamp duty. Who, who, who would pay that? So how do we benefit? I thank you. That was a response. That's as basic as I can as I can I can make it. My question is really twofold. Um that's going back to the case. You you had a situation where a public servant was sent home. And you, you had to seek recourse uh, from, I consider you guys to be private counsel. Um, I, I'm not sure if I got it told these persons were members of the National Union of Public Workers, right? Uh, so my question really is, uh, what recourse um, would the, the, the persons had within the National Union of Public Workers without coming towards private council um, first. And also I wanted to make a comment also as it relates to the compensation for uh, the, 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 the two persons within the case. Uh, Cause I know that the, the, in 2020, the Caribbean Court of Justice uh, made a ruling as it relates to the Employment Rights Act um which which spoke to the loss of wages and it ruled in favor of uh, i think at the time it was Shafet limited as it relates to awarding we will call loss of wages over at some other periods of time right uh so i wanted your guys opinion on that and if you view if you view the situation with the loss of wages as it relates to pain note that um Money, according to the court decision, or in the context of the court decision, uh, how do you view those those outlooks? Um, can, I, can I deal with the, the last question? The Employment Rights Act doesn't affect public officers, mm -hmm. right? The Employment yeah. Rights Act deals with employment in the private sector, so that the Shafet decision will not have any bearing at all on on these cases whatsoever. Um, we can come back to that a little later. I'll tell you this, um, prison officers are not allowed by law to be members of a trade union. Yeah. In fact, I represent the Barbados Prison Officers Association in which we have challenged the amendment to the Prisons Act in 1982. That challenge was brought, I think in 2017 and we are awaiting a decision from the court that has challenged the, the amendment which purported to create the Prison Officers Association, but still told the Prison Officers Association it cannot represent prison officers on matters of appointments, on matters of discipline, on matters of promotion. You know, a whole, what, whatever you would think a representative body would be established to do within the context of, of, of prison officers because hitherto they were members of the NUPW, but along comes the 1982 amendment, creates the Prison Officers Association, and then you classify trade unions as um, 
unprohibited or non-prohibited bodies. So if you go and join a trade union, if you're a prison officer, you can be fired, no pension. That is a provision in the prison that. So that currently, I represented the, the officers in that case. And we have been waiting for that decision, may I say, for some time now. And the truth is that we, we, we have the system that we have. We got a grin and bear it. But that is one of the reasons why Mr. Carmichael had to go to Mr. Gollop and, 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 and deal with Mr. Gollop personally, because the, the union couldn't help him. He's there as a consultant. Okay. He's a consultant, and I, 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 he's not his. I, he, I am sure he'd be very careful to, to say that he's not there as the general secretary of the Unity Workers Union because that uh, that will run those officers and Mr. Franklin in breach of the law. Oh, yes. I have I have a question about um, the, the whole issue, and I think I have a, I have a you can answer it, probably Mr. Bala, but this discussion has been around for a while. Um, the the whole issue of if Barbados needs a night court, and if the addition of a night court would make um, the whole judicial process a lot more faster, and a lot of matters that um, are minor, as they say, are trivial, could be dealt with with the night court. Um, what are your views on that? You go again, night lawyers. Night Sorry. lawyers, night guards, night everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been hearing that talk for a long time now. Working, you need a night working, on, working on the night shift. <laughs> but, but, um, but nobody in the system, no, 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 nobody who works in, in this, we, we need to be more efficient. And I'll say this, here, right? and I'll go, go, go put my hand on the block and say, one of the good things about COVID is that I have sat in my office today and did two matters in court. Wow. Right here at this desk. Yes. Wow. Before we would have had to go downtown we, until the judge has about 30 matters listed. The judge has 30 matters listed. And if they got Mr. Gola or myself on one of them matters, <laughs> 28 of them matters, you can get adjourned. And the yes. next day, another 30. Because that's the volume. Right? So when we, 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 we not Again, I'm not defending it because we live in this society. But when we not the judges, it, it, how is a judge going to take home, let's say, average 20 files to read for tomorrow? I'm going to hear Mr. Gola and Gregory Nichols in two of their matters. I'm suffering, okay? Make decisions, <laughs> make notes. You understand where you're coming from? And then the following day, which is Thursday, 20 more matters and afraid of 20 more. And it come and keep coming like that all the time. But what are some of the reasons for the adjournment, Gregory, in terms of these 20 year adjournments over two cases that will be heard for the day? I mean, other than taking home the first, what are some of the main reasons behind them? Um, I would um, they, 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 they vary. I mean, it yeah. could be that most adjournments are driven by the parties. Yes, yes. Not the judges. Mm -hmm. The persons who are before the court. I, I, I had to ask a judge today for an adjournment in a matter because the, the, the matter, the, the, all of the information my client was trying to gather together from the places he had to get the information was not available to him. So I had to come and say to the judge, well, look, I'm real, real, real sorry, but we didn't get this document filed because we're still awaiting information from place X, place Y, place Z. And, and some government the agencies too. And, the COVID and, the staff working this and some government agencies, for but, example, in family matters, you're waiting on a report from um, well, not the child the care, care board, board and welfare department, and, welfare department the and they're yeah. maybe understaffed and maybe they're overwhelmed. Uh, you can't proceed without the well, information I, or relevant documentation. So we'll have so, to so ask for right? Mm -hmm. The judge would send out an email every morning. Your matter is going to be heard at 11.40 or 10.50. So I know you log on just before. So I don't have to be standing outside licking him up with politics or with cricket or, or what's going on in the States. Well, well now that Trump gone, we ain't got there and talk about it. We, 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 we have to see how, but you you're not, being, you're not being productive. 
where you're standing outside the courtroom right. there for yes. two or three hours while other matters being going on. So yeah. you can go sit in your office, do your work, and when it comes up, you know, you get ready, you can do what you yeah. want to do and thing and, and stuff, and, you, and you're there. So, but we will get there, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm not one really to really knock the system. Yes, I will quarrel that judgments are outstanding in matters that I have. But the truth is that I know all of the judges, well, the ones that came from overseas, but they were all lawyers when I came to the bar. Mm. And they're all reasonable people. They're not, they're, they're not people who that you would say, well, hand the right to be a judge. So, so when you get this is Greg, system, wait, wait, wait. Mm. when you get in the system, mm. and as like I said, the, the, the pace at which litigation and works in the work work in the court system moves, right? Every year there's 40 lawyers joining the profession. Then 35 leaving. Exactly. So, so, so they they you know? sorry. So so yeah. I think that probably based on what you're saying, Gregory and Saffron and uh, Mr. Goddard to some degree, is that the the expedience of which um, the, the whole process the whole legal process would, would happen is contingent on other parties and other departments and everybody else working. So one of the benefits you said with COVID is that a lot more would have been done virtually. So would you say that the future, would you say that the future, any of you can answer it, that the future of, of, of law or, or the court system may be a situation where matters could be, could be heard virtually even outside of COVID or if COVID ever leaves us, do you think that's the way forward that some cases will be heard virtually and others, um, depending on the on what it is, would require the presence of all the parties? Well, I don't like the word virtually. That's <laughs> a, a, an Americanism that you people have taken lock, stock and barrel. I like to say remotely. Because Remotely, my, understanding, my understanding of something being virtually done means that it is not done. So mm. anyhow, but these remote hearings have been one of the benefits of the COVID thing, is, um, the COVID intervention, as Gregory has pointed out. I had a full trial today remotely. Wow. So that, so that some matters... All those procedural matters, um, which you can, which you have to go to court for ordinarily, may be done by a remote hearing, because there are orders being made, directions being given, etc., etc., etc. There are some trials which would not suit a remote hearing because you want to have the witnesses present, present, sorry, and you want to see their demeanor and all of that and all of that. But mm -hmm. certainly like the one which I had today, where submissions, there were written submissions made to the court, presented to the court and to the other side. And you came and you argued your submissions. You presented your submissions. That kind of trial could easily be accommodated in this kind of hearing. Mm -hmm. So COVID has been a mixed blessing in this regard. Because what it does too, as we pointed out, you can sit at your desk with your computer or your telephone or whatever instrument you're using to communicate by, and you're doing things, doing things until you get your signal that you are ready. Mm -hmm. So that is an intervention and I'm absolutely confident that that is going to continue even if COVID leaves us. Um, right. As I said, there's some trials there's some, there's some trials that can be accommodated too by remote hearing. Mm -hmm. And um, others, like criminal trials, for example, you need witnesses, especially. Yes. And yes. you need to see the demeanor of a witness. So a cross-examination taking place without um, people being present to see how this fella has been reacting and to test a jury test whether he's telling the truth or mm -hmm. whether his demeanor reflects something that is not that cannot be easily done by um, a remote oh, hearing, yeah. and some civil matters similarly as well. Some civil matters require witnesses being examined and cross-examined, 
and you put through the same process of testing their demeanor to see if, you know, this fellow might be lying. He looks, his body language is not consistent with truthfulness and that kind of thing. But we have to learn, we have to take all these uh, setbacks and turn them into benefits if that can be done. And I think the setback, which we all face when the courts were shut down, when COVID came almost like a, a thief in the night, literally speaking, uh, figuratively speaking, I should say. Um, the setback we had has now been somewhat cushioned by the availability of this kind of facility. Zoom, Microsoft, all these various platforms. And I am learning about them, Saffron. Uh, so it's all right. If I may I'm add, I'm better than I was. I'm far better than I was. If I may add, and, um, personally for me, personally for me, I prefer mm -hmm. to do family hearings via um, Zoom or Microsoft, that app there. Um, I find that it tempers the acrimony between parties. We don't feel that energy bouncing off the walls when we sit in chambers, wow. in a judge's chambers physically. And I find that we're a little bit more civil <laughs> via Zoom hearings, in family hearings. With, yeah. um, tempers, we, it, it tempers the acrimony and, and, and hostility between the parties. And for me, lawyers behave a little bit more civilly. So I prefer it in certain hearings, certainly family family matters. Take note of that. Uh, I want to jump in here to ask a question. This, this is going to completely change the trajectory of the conversation. Uh, but Mr. Nichols, I, I took interest in a particular case that you would have represented um, because I, as everybody knows, I am a lover of financial issues, economics, and the like. And, um, there was a situation where the last governor of the Central Bank was fired by the Minister of Finance and you would have represented the case. A um, couple of years after there were some changes as it relates to the legislation uh, surrounding um, the governor of the central bank and the ability or inability to hire or to fire. Uh, so I wanted some context to the situation because it, it was quite messy and there's still some gray areas as it relates to um, the, the, the case. So if you could, you know, just fill in the blank somewhere and get us to understand what really happened, uh, that would be excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I can say, Kimura, is that this that case is still very much in the system. Oh, oh sorry, sorry, they didn't mean to. Um, yeah, well. but, but what, what, what came to the public for uh, um, was we, we my clients sought an injunction to stop the Minister of Finance from firing And I'm glad you raised it because I am actually doing a, a, a publication on central bank finance, um, independence, and the autonomy of central banks, um, how, how that autonomy is threatened and by, by those type, types of actions. And I, I just want to get a chance to set the background here because a lot of what went on in the application for the injunction, we got the injunction, the injunction was then discharged, we appealed that decision, we got another injunction to stop the dismissal pending the appeal, and then the Court of Appeal made a decision that if the minister was wrong in firing him, then at trial, he would get damages, so we are not going to stop the minister. Um, I think it was a regrettable decision of our court of appeal because it, it set the tone for this point. And I hope I don't alarm people when I say this. In a public law case where a citizen challenges the actions of the, of the government in all of its emanations, whether it's a minister, a government department, government agency, whatever, statutory board. If that government authority is alleged to be acting unlawfully. And the applicant in the matter says to the court, look, I want you to stop this unlawful act from taking place before it takes place, or if it is, has started, I want you to stop it. 
the effect of that discharge of the injunction by the Barbados Court of Appeal is that the court will say, well, look, if the person is going to get some remedy at the end of the day, I will not stop the unlawful action. And that is the effect of that decision. A lot of people haven't really understood it, right? And I want to say this. The Central Bank Act is the only piece of legislation that I am aware of that requires where there is a clash between the technical expertise of the government agency or government department and the executive, which is the minister, the mm -hmm. government, et cetera. Government ministers can override technocrats in the civil service and across the spectrum of government every day. It happens all the time. This is the policy of the government. But in the Central Bank Act, because of the importance of the institution of the Central Bank, where we are dealing with the monetary supply and the monetary autonomy of the Central Bank, and that is importance in the economy, when there is a difference of policy between the minister and the Central Bank governor, the Central Bank sets out a process how that is to be dealt with. Mm. And my client's case was, that because there was that difference of process, the minister sought to resort to the, term, the, the, the clause in the appointment letter saying, I appoint you to this post and I can fire you by giving you six months notice or, or money in lieu of that. And, and the simple point was this, if the minister has a view on the printing of money, right? And, and it's different from the central bank, the minister can override the governor. But the Central Bank Act says you have to lay it in both houses of parliament and publish it in the Gazette. If the minister wants to override that policy decision of the Central Bank, if he wants the Minister of Agriculture wants to override the Chief Agricultural Officer, he sends an order that this is the decision of the cabinet and it will be overridden. But only in this piece of legislation Parliament says when the Minister of Finance wants to direct the policy of the central bank, there's a process. And all the argument was you can't go around those provisions in the act. Uh -huh. You fire the man so that you get what you want. All right, so my question, my broader question to the panel there. What is your take on contracts for civil servants at such high levels? Uh, I know it's a public conversation right now. That's so, right. You were all that you would have reviewed. Contracts for you or no contracts for you? I don't think it's a simple me. question of, of, of whether it's a contract or not. I think it's a discussion. I think we need to start that discussion. Um, I agree. My, 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 my view of it is that the public service that we inherited from the British or this notion of the public service, there's a reason why the the, the political directorate do not hire public officers. It is because the public servants are supposed to be impartial, independent. Their mm. political views do not matter. They must serve when the government changes, they must serve the new administration. Equal mm. fervor and an equal result. My, my only difficulty is that when you create mechanisms for hiring people in the higher echelons in the public sector, by way of contract, it now lifts that protection of the Services Commission, which is the buffer between the executive, that is the cabinet and the government, mm -hmm. and the appointment of the persons, right? So that that is something that the unions and the government have to have discussions on. I think the government has started to ball rolling on that discussion. And, and it's not new governments have, they're, they're, they're officers that are appointed by contract. But if you're doing do it on a much more widespread basis, I think we need to have that conversation as to how those mechanics work out. Okay. I tell you why, I tell you why, but I should proffer a view where there has to be extensive conversation because there's a more fundamental reason. In the Gladwin Ophelia King case, the Barbados court ruled, and it, it was upheld by the Privy Council, that there is nothing such as a contract existing between the Crown and its civil servants. 
that the relationship between the state and its civil servants is one of status and not one of contract. Mm. Consequently, if a civil servant, a civil servant as opposed to a public officer, every civil servant is a public officer. But not every public. But every public law servant is not a civil servant because you've got people in the statutory corporations that set who are public officers, but they do not appear on the civil establishments list. So they're not civil mm -hmm. servants properly so-called or by their status. So that the court, if a civil servant presently under our constitutional arrangement wishes to challenge a decision of dismissal, they usually do so by a constitutional motion. In the case of Ms. King, hers was an allegation that her rights to property were infringed when her salary was cut, the salary cut case. And that case gave rise to that, as the establishment of the principle because the principle was always there, going all the way back to some South African cases that were cited, that there is no such relationship of contract between the Crown and its servants. So if there is going to be a scale imp um, implementing of contractual relationships throughout the civil service, in my view, they will have to take a look at the constitution again and see how, that, how our constitution provides for these contractual initiatives. So Gregory spoke, spoke about the discussion, there has to be discussion. And there has to be discussion starting at a very fundamental level, dealing with relationships between the state and its civil servants. Okay. I don't think it's easy to say you give a man a contract for X years or X months as the case may be. That's very easy in a, in a statutory board. I'm not so sure it is so easy in the civil service. I think right. Lee Kwang Yu in, in Singapore, I think that is the exemplar of being able to incentivize the brightest, more progressive minded people in society to come and work in the government sector by way of contract. And, and, and but obviously Singapore is a different country than Barbados so they may have the resources <laughs> to pay at that level to attract the best brains. In other words, they, they have turned the model on it. Said the best brains don't work in the private sector, it works in government. Oh, oh, but 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 you needed a, a kind of level of authoritarianism to, to be able to push through. I was just about to say the cultural norms and ideals are different also. Yes, and we have to right. take totally that, different. We have totally to take different. that into account. Um if I could yes. can pull in a question here just on the flip side as well. Um I hope uh, just to go back on the helping the ease of the, the whole um justice system. Um I know well, is the wording is kind of new for some of us now. Um, how or uh, what do you guys think about um, mediation and arbitration as it as it speak to uh, helping to speed up the whole justice? If it does in any way, uh, justice system. I've heard people starting to throw around that word now of mediation to helping to deal with some of these issues um, that uh, and it seemed like it's quote unquote a faster process than having to be in court um, based on what we are hearing. So anybody could bring any light to uh, mediation and arbitration, how it can assist the system? It is, it, is always, it is always preferable if parties can resolve their problems outside of a court situation. Uh, that is a formal court situation. And where that may be encouraged, it would be advisable and desirable. There are some matters that lend themselves to mediation and arbitration more easily than others. So there's room for all of them. Arbitration, mediation, there's a lot of mediation going on now in the court process, especially in family matters. Okay. Um, but, there, but the mediation extends to other civil law matters as well. Um, the 
aim of mediation is to bring parties together in a less acrimonious and adversarial situation where they can sit down and have an agreement of certain issues that you can dismiss as having been settled and then work on those which are more problematic. And the aim is to work towards a solution in a non-adversarial or let me say a less adversarial situation than ordinarily presents itself in a court of law where you have plaintiff and defendant or claimant and defendant or claimant and respondent and so on. So there is scope for all of that. Arbitration is a slightly different animal. Arbitration is not cheap. And arbitration usually results where contractual arrangements make provisions for arbitration. But that is a, a specialized area and it is not the kind of remedy available to ordinary matters. Um, arbitration is really more um, often used in matters where there is a very, um, what? What? Uh, there huge is a, commercial matters, huge commercial. A very commercial, it. high commercial yeah. matters, matters where lots of money is involved, building contracts, um, contracts for some, often contracts of that kind of nature, like building contracts and um, contracts for provisions of some services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But high commercial contracts, that is at the higher end of commercial law rather than ordinary civil law um, mm -hmm. matters of contract and so on. But there is scope for all of them within the justice system at varying levels. Anyone else want to take, uh, that's it for that? Okay. Chapron, do you want to? Sorry. No, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Do you have any question before we get to wind up? Yeah, I got um, one a question. Um, I think it was Gregory or Mr. Gollard, I can't recall who made the point about uh, statutory words. Uh, right now, they're in a situation where the NAS is about to go to a statutory word. Uh, so I was, I was wondering, for me and for the public say, what is the difference between this current state and a statutory board? And my second question um, would be, uh, as it relates to a pension, public service pension, um, I, I know under the IMF program, we are due for pension reform. So I was just a little concerned if there will be change of terms of, change the terms of uh, um, the current pension arrangements for civil servants. The, you can you could take your you could take your advice on the NIS from what has happened with the hospital. Um, hospital workers were civil servants heretofore until it became a statutory body. And um, there is a general practice in the civil service that you do not lose your pension rights. Um, if you move from the mainstream civil service to a board, there is a continuation of your pension rights. You don't lose that. And as a matter of fact, the trade unions will be very, very active to make sure that, it, that they advise their members along those lines. And they would certainly not advise their members to, to sanction a transfer of status if those situations are not clarified and made certain. But um, it is a matter of decentralization, if you want to call it that. And that is a modern concept of administrative law. There's devolution of, of um, authority and there has been a movement to take the administrative process away from the central civil service kind of structure in an effort to gain greater efficiency. Mm. And that is why you have 
these statutory bodies growing up, they're given their, their own terms of government and they, they're given a statute within which to exercise those terms. But there is always the need to control them. That's why you have persons like Gregory, Saffron, <laughs> and me here. Because <laughs> having given these statutory bodies, having given these statutory bodies a certain level of autonomy to mm -hmm. function within their own four walls, you don't want them to behave oh, like laws unto themselves. You still have to control them. Correct. And that is where the tools given to us by administrative law, by public law, comes into place. And you've got to keep them within the four walls of their statutory authority. But again, that transfer of the NIS from civil service, properly so-called, to a statutory board is another kind of matter that requires discussion. And I'm sure the unions would, would, be, would play a very, very active role in advising its membership in this regard. All right. So any other questions? Okay, anything anyone would like to talk before we look to wind up? Any I, I wanted to, uh, with respect to the cases that we discussed today, um, a very crucial legal principle, and we learned it early in our legal careers, and even as students, that one of the things that came to me today when I thought about the two matters, not only must justice be done, but it must manifestly seen to be done. So once again, I emphasize that when public functionaries are carrying out their duties, you must abide by process, procedural fairness, transparency, so that it augurs well and upholds the principle of good administration. That's my takeaway. So where the powers that be now must revisit and where the circumstances require they must revamp the way in which they do things, particularly disciplinary proceedings, so that people are afforded fairness and their rights are protected. That's my takeaway. Mm -hmm. If you want to get some of the comments, got have quite a few comments, so I know if you want to read some before we wrap up. Um, and if Gregory wanted to say something before we think on any closing, before we get to the comments, or Mr. No, um, I, I can respond to any comments that you want. Um, there's nothing more you wanted to say. Okay. The um, obviously for another person, they they're really intrigued by the fact that we have lawyers on. I, I don't think um, <laughs> it's like if they've mm -hmm. never seen lawyers. Yes, we need some more lawyers to come on, thank you, Mark. Both yeah, Kimar, exactly. some more yeah. lawyers then. Yeah, uh -huh. people are I'll probably do segments where we have yeah, criminal but, uh, we have asked a couple of criminal attorneys coming on for next week, so it should be good. Uh, interesting. I'm trying to get some exciting. Here. That's your thing. Um, no, not really, but I like to um okay. visit the assizes from time to time to get a bit of the excitement. Downstairs is always more exciting than upstairs. <laughs> <to me. laughs> Um, I could imagine. Right, um, Thank you, but there are more comments than there. I think Kimar. So I, I don't. I just think that people are just responding based on the conversation. So they're not questions so much, but their comments. Okay. So I would just leave them where they are right now, as just comments for now. Um. So I don't think I've I've not seen any questions really being posed. At okay. This point. So we could leave it there for right now. Um as it relates to those persons, right? Um, I just saw a, call, a question asked, uh, how soon will we see the written mm -hmm. judgments of the cases? Oh, I didn't, um, I didn't see that. Go ahead, go ahead, Greg. Yeah, I, I think I could probably um, segue into one of my pet peeves. Uh, oh, that's the last we, question. We, 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 we need to have access to the cases and when I say we, I mean the public, you know, and 
I really think that the, 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 the press has to take a, a bigger responsibility for producing that um, broken down version of these cases uh, so that the public can understand and carry them in, in, in a way in which you don't only report on what is said in a criminal case, but you have the, 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 the resources to explain these types of cases to the public within the, the press and, and in those papers and, and in media houses should have that capacity. And there are lawyers who who who, who would could, could assist in doing that, you know, but it would help with the public to understand what the what what the, these developments mean. Mean that's it. Society that's it. and help that's inform it. and educate society. And this program, I must congratulate you guys for coming on because I'm I sure agree. Um, it's done a lot to, to sensitize people to some of the issues that came up in the case. And I will just echo what Saffron and Mr. Gollum was saying. Our clients were found to have done something wrong by the courts. In these cases, the judge is saying, we are not, the judge is not saying that they should not have been fired from the public service because it is something wrong, but it is not automatic. There is still a process. And if the process is not fair, mm -hmm. even if the decision is the right decision, mm -hmm. the, the decision has to be struck down because it cannot arrive at the right place by the wrong process. Wrong process. Wow. process that's unfair. That's Right, so that I mean, how many how many of us would have fired somebody who worked for us if we heard that they carry a ball around for eleven dollars? Fire them without giving them a chance, you know, and that is that is essentially what this, these cases are about. Um, so that I just wanted to echo that point, and because I saw some people saying that we should be fired every science, and we represent people that steal. No, we have not represented anybody that's stolen. I've seen comments about automatic dismissal, and this, the act, this, the act did say that it says you're liable, and liable right. to be dismissed is completely different from automatic dismissal. So we that's have to be right. careful as armchair lawyers too, in terms of interpreting what stats you'd say. We go by here, say liable, to, and, and I think the judge was at pains to point that out. Liable yes, to be yeah. dismissed is completely different from automatic dismissal. That is where I think the case turned. Mm. So we have to be cautious. What I tend uh, to see is that sometimes that, um, and as Gregory, if I can pick you back off of what you're saying, sometimes uh, we're ignorant of the fact or we're ignorant of the, the, the wording. And oftentimes I find that, yes, the uh, the the media sensation likes things for 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 their own gain and, mm -hmm. and it, it affects because I found yeah, even awesome. for me um, being in public like uh, uh, people don't read the article people read the headlines, headlines. and as soon as they get a headline it only takes one and they put it in layman term one clown to make a foolish statement and everybody is in the train and they have to know how the people in the train haven't taken the step to read, <laughs> to understand. Uh, but I would like to see more, uh, definitely uh, uh, um, from almost every sector that has a public, has a, the public interest, um, break down certain things like these so people can understand. I, I see in, um, right. if I was correct, in Guyana, whenever there's a cabinet meeting, uh, whenever a cabinet meeting is finished, uh, somebody comes out and explain about a contract, who it was awarded to, what, and the sum of what, and this is a decision by cabinet, whatever the case may be. And it give people the chance to comment, ask questions, and to know more and to understand a little bit more. So that when they do comment, it is not an ignorance that we are not only depending on the media to, to fill us with information, but there's an avenue where we can go. And I would love to see this also, as you said, within the legal profession, that when cases are called, whether it be by bar or other places, um, whether it bar or someone, um, set up some um, committee to do it and explain cases and don't only leave it to the media to give you snippets 
um, uh, and then leave you to make your own conclusion, like if you the judge itself of the person. And so I would love to see that as well going forward. Um, any final uh, remarks or comments? No, I, I would also like um, ordinary persons on, on, on the Warren ZR or the ordinary person in the Bridgetown fish market to also understand that when, when there are allegations against a person and you suddenly become an accused, you are still entitled to a fair hearing, you, you, you're, you're entitled, no matter how egregious your conduct. And I want people to always be mindful of that because we often get up and say, well, he a thief, he should this. Mm. And your son commit an infraction and you come to a lawyer, you're balling and you will <laughs> take out the last out of your life savings. Mm -hmm. And until it reaches your doorstep. So just be mindful that every accused is guaranteed by the constitution the right to a fair hearing. We have to hear first before we make pronouncements. So just be mindful of that. Right. And it I, could I, be you. And it could be you. I mean, mm -hmm. I really wish that I were true, but there's Barbados, there's the Caribbean, and you don't gotta do somebody just gonna hear that you do and you're guilty. I know that for fact. I myself, I myself have my bad experience and I could tell you that you know it is so it's, it's culture, it's unfortunate either way because people suffer reputational damage for such, but that's where I would encourage responsible journalism and to start writing stories that slant it in a way that you are forever tarnished and then persons can network and then they end back up in the criminal justice system because somebody said, I don't want you in my place because you was in the paper for rape or you bring a thousand pound of drugs across the border. So if that thing you found not guilty or the case gone, but still you can set it off. I want to also commend my seniors at the bar. I learned a lot today that in the, in the, in the time periods when I was silent, I was listening because as I said, we're always students of the law and what I am not or fair with or what I don't know, I listen and I also commend them for their knowledge and imparting their knowledge as well. So thank you, Mr. Gallup and Gregory. It was a learning experience for me today as well. <laughs> um, I hear you keep, guys keep referring to a word. I just wanted to just bring clarity for it for the uh, mm -hmm. viewers. You keep using the word learned, uh, like a lear lawyer. Learning. Learning. <laughs> what was, uh, Mr. Gallup, if you could give us that. I see that you're a seasoned kid. What's the, why you keep using the word learned? I it's think it's a, it's, a, it's a polite way. It's a polite way of uh, um, responding to your to your colleagues, uh, addressing your colleagues. We are all supposed to be learned men, mm. learned in the law, um, mm -hmm. and rather than looking for some way of addressing somebody that may be offensive even at times, you could easily save all those problems mm -hmm. by referring to your learned friend. Um, you don't even have to know his name. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I had an experience in Guyana um, working in those constitutional cases um, where Mr. Ralph Thorne and I were referred to by the man who is now Attorney General of Guyana. He was then in the opposition. He referred to the two of us as two aliens from across the sea. <laughs> <laughs> that good. Uh, that's, that's horrible. <laughs> well, he, he had his reason for saying that, but... but um, it is a way of politely referring to brothers at the bar. And the bar is an old the practice at the bar is in the tradition is as old as the hills. We go all the way back to the marketplace with Cicero and that crowd and, and, and uh, Seneca and all these ancient um, um, lawyers. Wow. And that is how they, they, they refer to, to, to each other. And it has come down through the years. So it is a polite mode of address. And um, the bar is still one of the most ancient of the professions. And those of us who like ceremony and ritual um, try to hold on to some, some of the better aspects of it. I think it is a good for the society. I think we should maintain those things which identify us and which regulate our conduct. And that is one of them. As far as law, it lends to the nobility of the profession. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, um, all right, um, gentlemen, 
Thank you very much. Uh, people, uh, persons are commenting both on the you know WhatsApp phone and also in the comment, uh, especially Corey Dane and Paul, uh, Corey, sorry, Corey Worrell, my bad, and Paul Gibson. They were really excited. Griffey Show, some other persons were also yes. and thought it was a good show and it was a refreshing, um, you know, drink to have uh, lawyers here that could explain. And they said that you guys, especially, uh, were very articulate in breaking down stuff. So we oh, yes. really appreciate it. We really appreciate you taking the time out. Thank to you. Debrief Barbados um, about um, about a number the cases and also about a number of different issues and I want to just thank you um, Facebook we also want to thank you for all those who have been um, with us um, we ask that you continue to follow the show like us follow us um, you have attorneys here if you ever need their services please feel free to reach out to them <laughs> we can't yeah, advertise we can't advertise we can but we can't. Sorry, um, I, 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 I suspect that you will have to, to have a second limb to Definitely. this show. Yeah, we will law only because I, I can see a True. number of big decisions coming out of our courts mm. over in the course of the next couple of months. Have you guys um, back? Huh? That you you are not going to be get to discuss Kimar, the other Kimar's other economic issues and stuff like that there at mm. all. Because um, okay. so I, I know some big decisions coming down on, on a lot of matters. A lot of work is going on in the courts, and you know, we in, in an environment where um, people tend to focus a lot on on legal matters. So, well, we look forward. forward. We look forward to today. Um, Corey, Corey World is saying this is the best debrief show today. Thank you, Corey. Really? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, we that's a bit far fetched, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> but it is probably Corey, a that one. Go on Facebook. We want to thank you. Thank you for coming live um, with us. Uh, again, follow us, like us, share us so that we you can know when we do come live. Um, we're going to start the video. See you again next week, Tuesday. We have a very interesting panel and a very um, a, a serious topic at hand to discuss next week. So we want to say stay tuned to then. Facebook, you have a good night.